just wait for a couple of people to come in and for the doors to be closed, and then we'll begin. that Robin's come through the door is, is, the, is, the, is the cue for us to begin now that the man has um, arrived. Right. Welcome, everybody, to this rapid fire in conversation. Um, my name is John Gaffner, um, Executive Director of a new initiative at Chatham House called UK in the World. It's my enormous uh, pleasure and privilege to be in conversation with David Lammy, Shadow Secretary of State for uh, Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, everything um, uh, wrapped into one in the new um, Foreign Office uh, limit. Uh, I've known David for as long as he has been a Member of Parliament for Tottenham in North London um, since uh, 2000. And uh, David, we were positing just a few minutes ago that we've, been, we've done various things at the Hay Festival, at various other places in the past, yeah. and it's great to be talking um, foreign affairs and the future of the UK's role in the world with you this morning. We've only got half an hour, so we're going to talk for um, five or ten minutes max and then throw it open to questions if I could ask all of you whether you are watching remotely or in the um, hall uh, here, if you could ask uh, incredibly concise questions and then hopefully David will get through um, as many of them as possible. Right, without further ado, David, welcome. Imagine a situation in which Labour is presently now, June 2022, in government. You are Foreign Secretary. Could you name me, please, two precise examples of foreign policy that would be significantly different? Two is going to be difficult. <laughs> there are quite a few. I think I would want to stress that a Labour government led by Keir Starmer would get back to multilateralism and back to honouring the rule of law. Um, these are um, hugely different times um, from the period when we were last in power. Um, there is no longer just one superpower. It's a multipolar world um, in which we have war in Europe, um, in which we have the emergence of uh, China as the world's biggest economy. Uh, and we've got these tremendous problems uh, uh, beyond our borders, climate uh, being central to that. The global food, food sh shortage will be driving further immigration. These are issues that can only be dealt with by a United Kingdom that is absolutely committed to multilateralism, understands that partnerships and alliances are key and absolutely understands the importance of the rule of law. And I say that against a backdrop in which um, authoritarian powers are a huge challenge. Uh, and of course, coming out of Ukraine, as I've spoken um, to countries beyond Europe, it's clear, particularly in the global south, um, that there is a degree of ambivalence, frankly, about the way we see things in Europe. That takes partnership, it takes negotiation, it takes discussion, it takes a fundamental understanding of multilateralism as the key to the UK's future. I'm going to press you specifically on Europe in a second, but could you be precise about multilateralism? What would change? Well, look, uh, we would not be at war with our European partners. Uh, we would not be uh, pursuing uh, breaking uh, international law uh, in relation to the bill that's going to be introduced in Parliament on Monday uh, that departs from a protocol agreement that was negotiated just two years ago. Um, uh, we, would, we would be getting around the table uh, with Europol, with uh, the French, with the Belgians on issues like the English Channel and those that are risking their lives and coming across the sea seeking safe routes uh, for partners, dealing with the Dublin Agreement, uh, hopefully finding a veterinary agreement 
uh, with our colleagues uh, in the European Union, dealing with financial services. Uh, there are a range of issues that flow from us leaving the European Union that require negotiation and close working. And uh, paramount amongst that is, of course, on security and cooperation. NATO has been obviously hugely important, and I've been keen, uh, my colleague John Healy has been keen, Keir Starmer has been keen to stress it was the Labour Party, in a sense, that, that birthed NATO um, out of that Attlee period uh, uh, and Ernest Bevin. But notwithstanding that, um, uh, clearly further cooperation is needed uh, in a context in which um, you've got the Indo-Pacific challenges uh, posed by China, but also, um, very sadly, the prospect uh, uh, of uncertainty in the US should they return to Donald Trump. That needs a united Europe. You will be pressed on this, as will Keir Starmer and your colleagues, at uh, the, the next general election campaign when it comes. We might as well press you on this now. Will Labour commit not to return Britain to, into the European Union? Is the European and British membership over, as far as you are concerned? Look, there was a protracted, very, very difficult debate and discussion. Everyone in this audience will know where I sat historically within that debate. It is a settled position. Uh, that means that, uh, now look, now that the pandemic is receding, the effects of the decision to leave the European Union, understandably over the coming months, over the coming years, uh, will be interrogated and there are consequences to trade. However, uh, there will not be a return to freedom of movement. Uh, there, that we cannot just uh, turn around where we were and move back into the single union, back into the, uh, uh, the customs arrangement. Therefore, those things are settled. But beyond that, of course, uh, in partnership with our European colleagues on financial services, on digital, on data, on veterinary, on, pro on, on um, uh, professionals and their regulatory uh, uh, requirements. There's a lot that we can, on, on the doubling agreement, there's a lot we can do in partnership together. Right, so just to remove any discernible doubt, no return to the European Union, no return to the single market, no, no return to the customs union, correct? Yes. Do you not understand that that will disappoint a lot of your members, a lot of your potential voters? There are a tremendous amount of people that uh, were disappointed um, as a result of the decision that the UK made uh, in the referendum, but we cannot continue, I'm afraid, that same debate. We cannot go back into that. Uh, we have to accept a settled position and move on from that position. Uh, it, I'm afraid, uh, and I think it's important to stress this, one of my great sadnesses um, uh, after the referendum was that Boris Johnson has not brought the country together. He has effectively decided to serve for one part of that constituent. It's the Labour Party's job to represent everybody. And plunging straight back into that conversation is not right. Uh, let the British public make their assessment uh, of the fallout of leaving the European Union, but also accept that we've, we're in a different position. I think it's also right to say um, it's, it, it does look likely that the UK will enter into recession in this period and indeed the European Union will be in recession in this period. I don't think those are the circumstances into which to reopen this debate. Very little, the FT commented a few days ago about the omerta, the almost complete silence over the economic consequences, the negative economic consequences of Brexit on, on the British economy. Labour has been quite quiet on the specific, you can talk about not reopening membership, but in, on, a, on a critique of the, not just departure, but the manner of departure? Well, I think that's unfair because I think that um, it, it, it was always going to be unlikely to be able to have that debate against the backdrop of a pandemic, particularly in which the government was, was quite rightly spending a lot of money to support people in that tough time. So I think the space is now opening up. Uh, you can see that trade, for example, with Germany is down substantially. Uh, that, I, I've seen the resolution foundation's work yesterday um, uh, and clearly there will be more of that over the coming months and years and so we can have that debate and that discussion 
Um, and the Labour Party will play its role in that, of course. Colleagues here, um, the audience will have some very good questions, and I invite you to do that in a couple of seconds. Just one quick one before uh, already many questions, uh, hands, hands are raised. Um, what, how would you um, and how would Keir Starmer handle a return of Donald Trump? Well, look, I think in an audience like this, um, this is a world in which we need certainty. Um, and notwithstanding my progressive uh, politics, um, whether there was a Republican in the White House or a Democrat in the White House, there was a consistency of approach in relation to foreign policy, the essentials of that arrangement that was made after the Second World War, uh, attitudes to NATO, uh, particularly attitudes to the allies in Europe, and that was a fundamental change, of course, uh, under Donald Trump. I think if Donald Trump were to return to the White House, um, uh, that would, I'm afraid, um, underlie uh, 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 an instinct that America can no longer be fully relied on. That has huge implications, I think, geopolitically. I think in the Pacific, actually, it has huge implications. Uh, but for us in Europe, uh, it means that we need a steadying the ship. We need, we need to be calm and we need to absolutely be united, and it's why the politics of division, the politics of populism, the politics of waking up every morning to a wedge, wedge issue, like Rwanda, like the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, like tearing up the ECHR, this is not a politics uh, that we need in this country. Uh, Liberal would turn their back on that kind of division, um, uh, and I think if, if Donald Trump were in the White House, it's even more reason for the UK and the European Union to be in step with one another. Just to interrogate you a tiny bit more on that, um, the United States could not be fully relied upon. What does that mean? Does that mean a, a stronger European architecture? If that's the case, Britain is not in the EU. Are you thinking of some kind of uh, reinforced EU, NATO somehow circumventing the United States? What exactly are you meaning? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's empirical and it's a matter, it's self-evident that Donald Trump uh, was the first US president to um, demonstrably depart from a, a consistent approach to NATO. Um, um, I, I would hope that if he came to office that would not be repeated, uh, uh, particularly given um, uh, war in Europe. Um, there were issues around his attitude and posture to Russia. Um, uh, again, that would be hugely problematic were he to come to office. So, um, look, I think that uh, a return to Donald Trump raises significant issues for the Western uh, global alliance. That, that, that the way to sum that up is around certainty, and it would be for Europe to supply a degree of certainty and the sort of silly spats, for example, that we see between Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron. That sort of behaviour just would not be acceptable in those circumstances. Thank you. That's very clear. Goodness. Um, so many questions. Right. <laughs> right. Where do we um, begin? Right. Uh, Jen, right there at, at the back with a hand up. Uh, yep. There. Um, and uh, uh, right here in the front um, uh, after you. Yes. And, Super quick question. Uh, Robbie Yates from Chatham House. Would Rob, sorry, uh, a new see. Labour government restore the Department for International Development? Thank you. Uh, let's take a few questions together. Sorry, Robin, I didn't see you. I don't have my glasses on. Um, <laughs> Jesse Scott from Agora Energy Vendor. Where does climate change come in your order of priorities for multilateralism? The IPCC has said very clearly that we are on a route to two degrees. That's unadaptable for human civilization as we know it. And the action to avoid that is before 2030. Thanks. Thank you. Um, gentlemen there, um, here, uh, thank you, uh, and uh, here in the, front, in, in the front row, and then uh, lady there in the, in the white uh, jacket. Uh, same with yourself, member of Chatham House. Um, Mr. Lamy, you mentioned that uh, there will not be any possibility of returning to European Union under Labour government. The question I want to ask you in addition to that, 
then the current government is considering to abolish the Human Rights Act. And therefore, after that, will be probably withdrawing from the European Court of Human Rights. What is your comment on that? Thanks. I, I don't worry, I'm keeping, I'm keeping, I'm keeping a, a, a list. Kishra, and then one more, and then we'll stop. I can stand. Kishra Faulkner from the House of Lords, cross crossbench member. Um, the title of this is meant to be The UK and the World, and John mistakenly has steered you into spending a lot of time talking about the EU. You wanted to talk about multilateralism. So could I ask you, in an era the previous session talked about how multilateralism has completely broken down. Somebody's just asked you about climate change, we need China for that. How do you see when you, so much of your efforts are concentrated on repairing some pretty broken mechanisms in the EU, how do you see engagement in terms of a rules-based rules order when you don't seem to have any concrete proposals to put there? Right. Thank you. And um, Lady Dyer in the white jacket, and then over back to you. Thank you, Carol from Chibner Scholarship. Um, I'm wondering, a bit beyond that, what should be the priority for the UK now with the international affairs? Should the UK focus more in an individual level, which means make stronger partnerships with other countries or address global agendas and go for climate changes and go for the reconstruction of the world post-pandemic? What do you think it should be the priority? Because, I mean, we cannot do everything at the same time, I guess. Right. Thank you. Uh, first, question, Rob's, uh, first question, which was, Rob's, uh, are you going to be restoring um, DFID? Wherever I go in the world, DFID had a preeminent reputation. Um, it was a global leader, frankly, and it has been a disaster um, to merge the Foreign Office and DFID. It's been a huge distraction. Um, there's low morale now um, in what's left behind. There's expertise that has been lost at all at a time um, when, um, uh, because of the problems that I've outlined, um, we need a real focus. Um, I think it's a huge strategic mistake um, to have departed from 0 0.7. I think it's, it's really unfathomable that given the challenges that we have post-pandemic um, and post-Ukraine, um, uh, particularly in relation to food shortage, that um, FCDO should effectively cut the aid budget uh, by 37%. Um, uh, now, we're absolutely committed to development and aid, um, and um, we would want a restoration when we came, came to power. Um, I don't want to make the commitment to have a return to DFID, and the reason I don't want to do that is because I frankly do not want to come to office as Foreign Secretary um, and have more upheaval um, in a department that's just had up upheaval. I want to get on and do some things. So if you, if you may, I want to make that assessment uh, at the time uh, and do what is appropriate uh, to ensure that Britain returns um, uh, to that key major global road in relation to development. How that's done, I don't think it's right to be prescriptive about um, today. But just briefly in a word, it would be right to extrapolate from those remarks that you want to make it work better. It's very unlikely you'll, you'll change the deck chairs again. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said let's make the assessment at the time. We're, we're probably two and a half years away, well two years away from the next, next election. I, I know morale is low. I hear the calls um, uh, for a return. Uh, let me just say this also. I, I, I'm I think in the changing picture, um, this is not just about development and aid. Uh, the world will probably still be in the midst of huge humanitarian crisis. I was just in Afghanistan um, two weeks ago. Yemen, Ethiopia, the Sahel, the Horn of Africa. So there's a humanitarian issue as well. When we get to development, when I came into this post in November, the real discussion was about uh, vaccines, uh, supply, uh, globally and supporting the global south. It, it, it does seem to me that it is not, uh, and the COVAX scheme played a role, but clearly we've had huge surpluses, for example, in the West. Surely the debate 
uh, in relation to challenges that exist globally, is how could the UK have done more and can do more over the next period with its scientific capacity, with its huge preeminence in higher education, to actually support a continent like Africa to manufacture its own vaccines. So it's not just as straightforward as the aid debate. That's the sort of thing, innovation, that you'd expect a Labour government to be getting into over this next period. Which, al which allows us to segue into the, into the question about climate, but it is such a broad question about Labour's priorities on, on climate. It's hard for you to uh, give a couple of nuggets, but, but uh, do if you can. How would, you, how would Labour's climate policy well, be differentiated from the present government's? Well, the, we saw this in COP. There was a lot of rhetoric and not enough delivery. Uh, there was no sense of urgency. We were chairing the event. Uh, uh, so, uh, let me be absolutely clear, climate remains the fundamental challenge. We have an opportunity uh, um, uh, that none of us envisaged uh, in relation to um, uh, energy particularly and the way that we can accelerate renewables. We must grab that opportunity uh, in partnership particularly with the European Union. We have a challenge because at the moment China is the biggest emitter and we have to work globally if we are to seed in the problem. Uh, as we head to Egypt, this will be hugely important and we must harness that opportunity. Um, we in opposition have been clear um, on the 28 billion that we've pledged in terms of the changes that have got to happen internally within this country, on insulation, on renewables, on green jobs, on a whole various... So I think the Labour Party's commitment is absolutely profound, but it's the global leadership that will be necessary. So thank you for the question on climate. Be under no doubt, and I would refer you prior to coming into this job to my TED talk on that very same subject. Thank you. Um, ECHR, oh, there was a question on that. In addition, there's an online question from Joe Cole, student, along the same lines. You mentioned the quote, tearing up, unquote, of the ECHR. What measures do you think should be put in place to secure UK human rights? Well, look, uh, let's be clear. Um, the lead of the Labour Party is an international human rights lawyer of serious repute. Um, I am a lawyer by background. Before coming into this post, I was Shadow Justice Secretary, and once upon a life under Tony Blair, I was a Justice Minister. Um, I think it's unbelievable that a political party uh, that was instrumental in constructing the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, with Churchill, uh, Maxwell Fife, and others leading that, should now be in a position where they want to depart from that. Uh, the Bill of Rights they're suggesting is actually a power grab. Uh, it's not rights for the British people, it's less rights for the British people. And, we, and to be undermining human rights uh, when we see the reckless way uh, in which uh, Putin is behaving um, in Ukraine, I just think is extraordinary. I think it's populism. I think it puts us outside uh, of of sort of democratic norms um, and clearly in office we would seek to repair that. Um, uh, now, the truth is, coming into office, the next Labour government will have a long list of things that I'm sure we would want to put through the House of Lords to repeal. But the list is going to be very long and we've got to have a positive agenda. And I don't know what the, what the, what the, what the order will be, but you, I think I can indicate as strongly as I can that any departure from the European Convention here completely, com I, I just think it's abhorrent, frankly. I invite you to comment on, uh, or, or to take up Kishwa's uh, request to develop your thoughts on multilateralism more broadly than we did in the introduction. Well, look, I think that there are, um, at this point in time, there are institutions that are feeling stronger. Um, NATO is feeling stronger and united. Uh, a central multilateral forum. Um, the European Union, actually, is, is feeling stronger and more united. Um, successive sanctions working very well and actually working very well in partnership with the UK. Clearly, this has been a problem period for the United Nations. Uh, and with Russia and China in the Security Council, there are, uh, this, is a, this is a tough period, let's face it. Clearly, institutions like the OSCE uh, much love doing, uh, we saw incredible work with what they were doing in the Donbass. Uh, uh, problematic for them, of course, now that Russia has taken the action 
um, uh, that it has. The G7, I think, has been a very important forum, and it's hugely important that we engage with countries like India, Indonesia, others in relation to the G20. Uh, so when I talk about the Quad has been important, I was in Australia just a few, um, um, a few weeks ago. So look, um, all of those forums have to be used. We have to be flexible, fleet of foot. Um, we have to be properly engaged on across all of those frontiers over this next period in this multipolar world. And I guess I suppose I, I'm saying that um, what happens when populists come to power uh, and in our country is actually a tendency towards isolationism um, um, and there's a version of that um, uh, here in the UK which is kind of little Englander. Uh, that is precisely not where we should be, and it's not where a Labour government would be. To that point, uh, the, the colleague who asked the question about multilateralism, minilateralism, bilateralism, uh, should you not be praising this government for being uh, quite agile, picking and choosing, going after alliances, going off um, giving guarantees to Sweden and Finland, not being hidebound by traditional institutions? Is there any mileage in that point of view? Uh, look, look we, we have been um, very supportive of Ukraine over this period. We're absolutely supportive of Finland and Sweden. I've been to both Finland and Sweden, uh, been very engaged with their leaders. Uh, there would be no difference, frankly, between the government and us uh, in those areas. But I do think this is a government that's creating tremendous uncertainty. Um, I think the world has been shocked at this Rwanda policy um, that's unworkable, unethical. Um, uh, unimaginable, frankly, um, uh, years previous under any uh, uh, government that we've had um, uh, in the past. Um, uh, uh, yes, there are, there are things like the Jeff. Again, we would be um, committed to that in terms of defence and our support um, for the Baltics. But I do think it's right to point out that their assessment in the integrated review, uh, that there would be uh, no longer any need for a sort of, there'd be, there would be no more tank warfare in Europe, um, that it was all about the Indo-Pacific, I think that judgment was, was incorrect. Um, they, they published an international development strategy um, uh, just a few days ago. Um, I, I mean, I just don't think it was the level of expertise, detail and range that we had previously fr um, from um, DFID. Um, uh, so, and, and, I, and I think... Uh, when, you, when you go to Washington, of course, there's been lots of support and cross-working on Ukraine, but every single senator, every single Congress uh, uh, person, uh, Republican or Democrat, is raising what the hell is the government doing in relation to the protocol and undermining the Good Friday Agreement? How can that be sensible with one of our closest, uh, our closest allies? Um, uh, I, I mean, I... I don't know if this is for sure, but I'm told that the relationship between Boris Johnson and Emmanuel pa Macron is very poor. This is not, this is not helpful for us um, going forward. So I think you know, th there's, there's very little that a Labour government would seek to replicate <laughs> in relation to both bilateral arrangements, uh, multilateral arrangements, um, and the various forums that with which we uh, have to work. And let me just say this. Um, the Global South notices if the UK is a country that can keep its word. Um, I was in Afghanistan two weeks ago. I spent most of that time with tears running down my eyes. Uh, I, I'll never, ever forget, till the day I die, sitting with a 17-year-old girl um, uh, who, was, who was beginning her medicine course last year. Uh, but has had that all taken away from her. And her saying, what is the United Kingdom going to do to help me? Where are you? Um, uh, we cannot leave behind those people. Um, and we cannot be in a situation um, in which every relationship we strike is purely transactional. Um, uh, we have to base our foreign policy on a set of principles that we hold there. And it's why I stress the rule of law, particularly, um, uh, multilateralism and a powerful sense of the importance of democracy at a time when democracy uh, is on the slide. We're running out of time. I would like to ask uh, 
two issues we have not discussed that are absolutely vital. I only would like to take questions on them. One is Ukraine and Russia um, more generally, and the other is China. Um, are there any questions on either of those two questions that you would like? Yes. Thank you. Let's just wait for the microphone. And Arisia. So my question is, I was with, uh, David Miliband was here the other day, and in his position as head of the International um, Rescue Committee, he was talking about right now we have 100 million refugees, displaced people, which is as much as more than since the Second World War for the first time. So much of that displacement, now what's happening, you're talking about potential starvation in Africa by Russian policy. And my question to you is we seem in the West to constantly be jumping to respond to it as opposed to looking at it in a more holistic and from a broader perspective. Can you please talk to that, what we can do, and how we might be able to convince unallied countries that this is happening on such a broad scale that it affects everywhere and everyone. Thank you, Anurisia, and then um, back to you, David. Uh, Orisa Lutsevich, I'm the head of Ukraine Forum here at Chatham House. Great to see you. Good to see you. Uh, amazing that you did that trip to Kiev and right before the war to understand what's going on on the ground. And I think there is a shadow now over Ukraine's support that is cast by the fact that there, we are not very clear about the outcome we want to see in Russia. What kind of Russia we want to see? How do we achieve this? And what are we, price we are prepared to pay for this? So if you can outline a little bit, how do you see Russia uh, the, the, in the end result of this struggle and battle that we see now in Ukraine? Thank you very much for that. David, over to you. These problems without passports, climate being absolutely essential, clearly, if we don't get a grip, it will drive more and more people to flee the Horn of Africa, particularly. Um, it's clear, very sadly, that the blockade, effectively, of Odessa, uh, the protracted, ongoing situation uh, in Ukraine, uh, world hunger will also drive people and probably will drive further conflict uh, in parts of the world. So you're absolutely right that uh, migration um, remains a huge, huge global challenge. Um, I'm very closely in touch uh, with David Miliband and the work that the IRC are doing. I met with the IRC very recently uh, both in London and in Afghanistan. It does take serious partnership working across the global community. I was hugely impressed, by the way, um, very shortly after the war in Ukraine broke out at the operation to support refugees in Germany. I'm afraid it compares very poorly with the operation that was set up by Priti Patel um, over here. And that's not to do with the generosity of the British people. Uh, it's time to do with an ideological perspective on these issues coming from the top of the, current, of, of the current government. It's why I said, for example, we do have to negotiate with our European partners on issues like the Dublin Convention and what happens now that we're in outside the EU. Very hard to do, uh, sadly, uh, uh, with the protocol issues remaining as acute as they are and stirred up even further uh, by this government. So your question is an, is an apposite one. It's completely correct. Um, uh, it remains a huge global challenge and one in which you're quite right. We will need the support of countries um, like India, parts of South America as well, uh, if we're going to deal with it in a constructive um, um, uh, way. Uh, on the issue of, of, of Russia, um, Clearly, this is um, complex, and we could spend quite some time uh, on the issue. Um, I do think, uh, and we haven't mentioned this, that soft power is very important, and the UK has considerable soft power. I cannot understand against that backdrop what this government is doing in cutting the BBC World Service and cutting the British Council, uh, trimming it back, frankly, way beyond what, what is necessary 
uh, at this time. Uh, the BBC World Service is essential as part of that conversation in relation to public opinion um, in Russia. Um, uh, we've been really clear, and I think this is right, um, that this is about supporting um, our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in this cha challenge um, um, uh, 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 and the aggression that they are seeing. It's not about driving um, regime change from London in Russia. I don't think it can be uh, about that. Um, that is a persuasive and tenacious business, probably over several years indeed, and ultimately uh, it is, it's down to the Russian people. Um, we want Ukraine to be victorious. We want Putin to fail. Um, uh, but I think we have to accept that this will probably be a very long haul indeed. And just specifically, um, one quick follow-up question. What does failure look like? Must Ukraine have its 20... ...the Donbass is part of Russia. Uh, the international community is not going to do that. Uh, and so, of course, it means back to the 2014 um, uh, 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 context. Um, and I do think that um, uh, clearly um, Odessa, particularly, um, has not just got significant consequences for Ukraine. It's got significant consequences for the global community were that city to fall, uh, and it's why we must continue to be deeply engaged, I think, um, in, in what, and, and work with public opinion to be engaged in what is going on in Ukraine over what will clearly be uh, a tougher period, particularly in Europe, um, economically, for a lot, of our, a lot of our public. Next up on this stage, my colleague Leslie Vinjimuri is going to be chairing an illustrious panel looking at the US and Europe and can they hang together. There are a couple of spotlight events elsewhere which are equally excellent. Just would like to all of you to invite um, uh, you all to thank David Lamy. David, it is testament to you that there have been so many questions today. Thank you.